And uh, as mentioned, I'm from University of Essex, UK, uh, but I've also put uh, UESTC, uh, a Chinese university's logo here, uh, because some of the work was jointly done between Essex and uh, UES, UESTC. And uh, hello, everybody uh, in the audience. Uh, thank you for attending this uh, day long uh, uh, workshop. And my topic is centered around a specific uh, molecule uh, called uh, DNA. So everything I'm going to present here is going to be around uh, DNA. Uh, so here is a brief agenda of my talk. Uh, I will start with a brief uh, background and motivation, and then move on to uh, storage, uh, including both uh, traditional coding and also new kind of uh, coding, uh, more machine learning uh, driven joint uh, source and uh, uh, channel coding. And then I will move on to uh, DNA communications, uh, including the famous uh, widely used diffusion uh, channel and uh, non diffusion channel, more directional uh, kind of. Uh, uh, communication. Uh, and uh, then I will slightly touch on uh, DNA simulators, test beds, uh, and products, uh, hoping to give you uh, a whole picture as to how exactly we can do uh, when we want to do some DNA related uh, communication and uh, uh, storage. Uh, finally, I will um, uh, conclude with uh, some future directions uh, and a very brief summary. Uh, here, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my uh, co collaborators, uh, mainly from UESTC, uh, and the storage part is mainly, uh, I mean, uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Liu, and the, the DNA communication part is mainly from uh, Dr. Yu Sun. He was my ex-PhD student in Essex, but uh, he is currently working in UESTC. Uh, jointly with uh, Professor Yi Fan Chen, who is also an uh, active researcher in our uh, small molecular communication community. Um, we all know that uh, the current ICT systems uh, are facing serious challenges. Uh, for instance, uh, our processors have gone to a scale uh, of several nanometers, uh, making it extremely difficult uh, to be made even smaller, denser, uh, therefore faster in processing, uh, mainly due to the uh, physical law uh, limit. Uh, the data generated uh, are growing exponentially. Uh, our today's workshop is going to be uploaded to YouTube as well to the cloud. Uh, there are so many data generated uh, every day, every second. Um, we are getting to a point uh, where current storage technology cannot cope in a sustainable way. Probably most of us uh, are from um, communication society. Uh, we know that 5G has rolled out and we are looking to 6G already. It's great, uh, but their performance gain uh, is at a very high cost of energy consumption. Uh, people are saying that uh, uh, the deployment of 5G is for the benefit of a national grid, not for the uh, communication uh, community like uh, network uh, operators. Um, in particular, we are uh, in discussion of uh, this climate change, uh, carbon emission reduction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Basically, we need to uh, consider the energy aspect of our ICT system. Uh, so we are facing all those big challenges here, uh, which are largely in the electronic domain. But on the other hand, uh, our ability to manipulate DNAs, uh, i.e., bioengineering, not our ability, but those bioscientists and engineers, um, they have developed this new technology uh, in a very rapid pace. Uh, our ability to manipulate in uh, those uh, DNAs uh, has been increased significantly, and DNA has those very nice features. Uh, therefore, it's, it's time to look away from uh, electronic and uh, into molecular, therefore uh, molecular uh, computing, storage, uh, and communications. Of course, in my lecture, I'm going to be focusing on uh, mainly the uh, DNA aspect. 
so that's uh, DNA. Its basic molecular unit is also called uh, deoxynucleotide. Uh, each nucleotide contains one of the following four uh, bases, uh, i.e. the famous AG, ACGT, and they come in pair, uh, A always with the T and G with the C. This is called uh, pairing. Uh, by having those uh, uh, bases, and then we can simply represent uh, a DNA uh, using a base string uh, like AG, TZ, G, A, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's some basic uh, uh, concepts of uh, DNA. Uh, DNA has some very nice features. Uh, first of all, DNA exists in nature, uh, meaning it's cheap, environmentally friendly, uh, zero pollution, uh, and its uh, famous uh, double helix structure uh, makes it uh, very stable uh, because, because of this uh, uh, binding here, it's hydrogen bond. Uh, here it's uh, very stable. And uh, it has its uh, diversity feature as well because uh, the variety, quantity, and the sequence of those uh, base pairs are all changeable. For instance, a very short DNA molecule uh, with 4,000 uh, uh, base pairs or BPs. So this is a new terminology, not bit, byte, but BPs, uh, meaning uh, base pairs. Uh, and then the possible sequencing can be uh, four uh, to the order of 4,000. So that's a lot. That's why it has very high information density, uh, very good uh, for storing uh, information and also, of course, for transmitting as well. We all know that DNA is used to store our uh, genetic information. Um, and every DNA molecule contains a specific uh, base sequence. Uh, so that's its uh, uh, very unique feature of uh, specificity. Uh, having all those terminologies in mind, uh, now we can look into uh, ICT aspect, uh, starting with DNA storage. Uh, currently, we are using uh, probably still CD, uh, but largely USB um, hard disk and solid state disk. Uh, they are all electronic uh, uh, media. And uh, if you are old enough, probably you have used the floppy disk uh, as well. Uh, so the big problem with those uh, uh, thing is uh, they have limited uh, lifespan uh, as the data uh, amount of data increases, the cost, of course, will increase as well. The major problem is uh, after probably 20 years, we couldn't use them. Uh, I still got uh, some floppy disks at my garage, but I couldn't find the drive uh, to read them. Uh, after 20 years, uh, those information stored on your hard disk might not be readable either. So that's a big issue. How do we keep our information, our human civilization uh, for future generations? Uh, that's a big challenge. Uh, and then people turned uh, to the bacteria like DNA things. It has a lot of very good uh, features like uh, low, uh, long uh, lifespan, uh, low power. Uh, but here it mentioned that its uh, read speed is also quite, uh, um, quite fast, uh, but this is uh, a problem here. It's not really as fast as those uh, electronic uh, storage technologies. Uh, here is the, the, the table is from this, uh, uh, this paper. Uh, I think uh, why it's saying it's uh, fast is because this, this is uh, uh, per bit, uh, time per bit. Um, so here is still an issue, uh, a, issue uh, a bottleneck here. Uh, the reason why it uh, think it's very fast is because you can process DNA uh, in parallel. Um, so this is uh, uh, some seminal work in the history of DNA storage. Actually, people started thinking about DNA storage uh, not long after the DNA structure was uh, uh, discovered, uh, but not too much breakthroughs uh, until about 10 years ago, uh, largely due to the lack of uh, uh, maturity of uh, bioengineering uh, technology. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, DNA storage uh, was put into practical use, uh, mainly by these two people. Uh, probably you've uh, you watched the uh, video by uh, Nick Goldman. 
they have stored a lot of interesting information uh, in the DNA. Uh, and later on, uh, people are putting more effort uh, onto the coding aspect, uh, trying to improve its um, uh, density uh, and uh, uh, efficiency in terms of uh, error correction. Uh, so this table shows uh, a different uh, sequencing technology, uh, first generation, uh, second generation, uh, Illumina, and uh, we are uh, using the third generation uh, nanopore. Uh, it shows that all technology has been evolving rapidly uh, in terms of uh, different uh, aspects, including uh, throughput, cost, uh, error rate, etc. So this is a generic procedure for uh, DNA storage. Uh, actually, the same applies to uh, DNA-based communication as well. Uh, suppose we have um, a picture, a photo, uh, and then we compress it uh, before transmission, and then we do some encoding. That's a traditional telecommunication. Uh, tele a telecommunication uh, coding, uh, uh, we add some extra bits in order to uh, fight against the, uh, the noisy and interference in uh, channel. And then uh, we have this extra procedure, which is called a nuclear bias coding, i.e. to turn those uh, zero, zero, ones into those uh, bases. Uh, together, we call them DNA encoding because we want them to be done uh, jointly. Uh, and then uh, we do another uh, bioprocessing called uh, DNA synthesis. Uh, one important procedure is to add some primer, uh, some markers, and then put them uh, together. Uh, later on, we can know um, the different segments uh, where, uh, where they start. And then we can send, now they are in DNA format. Uh, they, they can be uh, transmitted uh, or stored somewhere. Uh, and then um, received by the, the other side, uh, they need to read the DNA. So this is basically the write uh, process, uh, the, uh, the procedure, and uh, the read is uh, uh, mainly carried out by what is called uh, DNA sequencing. And then we do the reverse process, uh, recover the uh, binary base, and eventually uh, the meaningful uh, content, uh, human readable. So that's the whole process. Uh, it's the same for storage and uh, communication. The only base here is we have to use those uh, uh, nuclear bases. Uh, um, uh, during this uh, uh, process, uh, transmission or synthesis or sequencing, a lot of errors could uh, occur, including uh, base level, like uh, substitution, A turned into, um, I don't know, G, uh, insertion or deletion of, of bases. And the sequence level, uh, a lot of things may happen as well. For example, a loss of a certain sequence uh, on even copy, because we do a lot of uh, copies, uh, PCR, uh, mainly here. Uh, and uh, there are also biochemical constraints uh, we need to consider as well. I will come back to this uh, a little bit later on. So that's the whole, uh, whole process. Uh, in terms of coding, the first thing researcher did uh, was to apply our traditional communication coding uh, for DNA storage. Uh, here you can see uh, the famous Hamming code, uh, linear block code, uh, fountain RS code, and watermark code. Uh, they are all applied uh, for storage as well. For detailed information, you can refer to this uh, uh, very interesting paper here. Uh, what we did is to introduce a polar code. Um, from the literature, we found that uh, base length uh, make makes impact on the performance of uh, error. Uh, as from this table, you can see, uh, this is number of uh, uh, bases, 10, uh, the failure is only like uh, 10%. If it's 95, then the failure is increased to almost uh, 61%. The, so this table says that we should try to use a uh, shorter code, uh, shorter bases. And the 3GPP has told us that the polar code is very good at uh, dealing with the uh, uh, short code. Therefore, uh, we used uh, polar code uh, in, in, the, in this process, uh, i.e. the polar uh, encoder 
Uh, there is nothing specific uh, here. And uh, this is the performance. Uh, we consider the, the error rate um, against the error probability of the, uh, for example, uh, sequencing uh, here. Uh, we used two different sequencing technologies, second generation and uh, third generation. The results are, are similar. Uh, here, we looked into polar code. Uh, of course, polar code will turn, um, for example, 100, uh, 1 to 8 bits to, uh, to double, for example, to double the number of bits. Uh, so that's, uh, that's BR. Uh, we also looked into FER. FER means frame error rate. The reason why we look at, uh, looked at also FER is because uh, those bits uh, are correlated. Um, if you look at those uh, uh, bases A and G, C, uh, the chemical feature, biochemical feature, uh, you know, uh, constrains them um, to a certain structure. You, for, for instance, you do not uh, typically have more than 50% uh, GC content uh, and other constraints. Therefore, we cannot just look at a, a single base. We need to look at uh, multiple bases in a sequence, uh, i.e. a frame. Uh, from this one, we can see that um, uh, uh, basically, uh, it shows that our uh, polar encoder uh, works uh, fine. Uh, we looked into a shorter code and relatively uh, longer uh, code as well, but not very long uh, because we don't want to make it very long uh, here. And uh, it performs uh, uh, quite good. Of course, if you increase the uh, code length, uh, the performance, the, i.e. the error rate will drop uh, as well. Uh, so that's polar code. Uh, but the polar code is very good at dealing with um, uh, substitution errors. Um, for insertion and uh, deletion errors, uh, we have to use another technique. In this particular case, uh, we used uh, uh, watermark code, uh, also a traditional uh, coding technique. Uh, introduced here, and we link the previous uh, polar code with this uh, uh, interleaver. So the rest of the process is same as before. Uh, here, let's look at uh, one particular component, uh, i.e. the watermark decoder. Uh, here, it's trying to uh, calculate uh, the value of i symbol. Uh, the point here is, uh, we are looking at not only uh, the i symbol, but also uh, the symbols before it and after it by m bits. Uh, you can define, uh, look at how many bits before uh, or how many symbols before, sorry. Uh, therefore, we have these uh, uh, forward and backward uh, matrix uh, functions uh, here. Uh, and then uh, we evaluated uh, this uh, technique uh, using this uh, frame array because we want to look at, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there are some uh, correlations between different uh, bits and, uh, and the base. So here it shows that uh, our polar watermark code performs better than LDPC uh, plus uh, watermark code. Um, uh, it considers uh, the uh, probabilities uh, of insertion, deletion, and substitution uh, errors uh, as well. And then based on the pre previous work, uh, we introduced the two more techniques uh, to further improve the, the performance. Uh, the first one is uh, rather than dealing with bits, uh, we worked directly on, on base. Uh, therefore, we can consider uh, the bio features of, of DNA. Um, uh, here, uh, each uh, base, for example, A is mapped to two bits. Uh, and then we can deal with uh, the first bit and second bit uh, separately and in parallel, uh, odd, uh, odd bits and uh, uh, even bits. Uh, so that's what we have done. And then the output is inputted into, um, into the uh, polar code if you look at the uh, decoder uh, side. So the next step we are going to do uh, is to uh, let uh, polar decoder to deal with the uh, uh, bases directly, uh, not uh, binary. Uh, one zeros. Uh, and uh, this one is to further introduce, uh, reduce the uh, error rate. 
uh, because typically we use in a for uh, archive because its processing is still very slow. We cannot uh, use it for real time processing. Uh, therefore, we do not mind slightly longer delay, uh, but we'd like to have much lower uh, error. Therefore, uh, we introduce this uh, iteration here, i.e. the output of this polar code is fed back into the uh, watermark uh, decoder. Therefore, we need to change the um, backward and uh, forward metrics uh, accordingly uh, as well here. So the, the final thing we did uh, in terms of uh, storage is to do the joint uh, source and the channel coding here, but using a modern method of machine learning. Uh, so that's the process. Uh, so our focus is here at the encoder uh, and here at the uh, decoder. So this is input signal. Uh, we are trying to get the output signal. Here, uh, suppose we are considering this, uh, considering this uh, DNA storage uh, uh, channel. Uh, the end of the, uh, the transmitter is this Z. So this Z is in the form of a DNA uh, sequence here. Uh, the whole idea is for machine learning is to tune those uh, uh, parameters uh, for those neural network. Uh, so this is theta here and uh, phi here. We are trying to calculate these uh, two things. Um, uh, nothing specific uh, uh, here uh, in terms of machine learning techniques, uh, very traditional. And uh, uh, we are the first to introduce uh, this uh, neural network into this uh, um, molecular communication uh, scenario uh, here. Uh, we, we, we designed this, those neural networks uh, to meet both biological constraints of DNA and also uh, the real purpose, i.e. image uh, restoration uh, quality. Uh, uh, here, we did some experiment, uh, not experiment, simulation. It shows that uh, uh, the GC uh, base G, base C content uh, makes impact on the error rate. Uh, for both uh, for for substitution deletion different color means uh, different uh, errors like uh, substitution uh, deletion or insertion uh, the same applies to uh, the amount of homopolymer okay uh, therefore when we try to calculate those parameters uh, theta and the phi they are optimal value we need to consider uh, both the GC content. So this is to calculate uh, the GC content. Um, and this is to calculate the uh, polymer, uh, polymer content. We try to minimize uh, the, the amount of them uh, to the ideal uh, criteria, uh, desired GC and uh, uh, homopolymer uh, content. We try to minimize them. Uh, in addition to the usual, um, you know, um, image quality. So we need to consider uh, both. So that's basically the technique uh, we are using here. Uh, here are some results. Uh, uh, so that's the, the DNA generated by uh, our algorithm. And uh, we, we analyzed its um, GC content. Uh, it's about 58%. Uh, um, within this uh, scope. Uh, in terms of the uh, polymer, uh, it also within the ideal uh, scope here. That means uh, our algorithm has considered those uh, DNA bio features. Uh, and of course, uh, the content is also uh, very good, uh, very close to the, uh, I mean, the, the machine learning algorithm is very close to the uh, ideal result. Right. Um, so my time is running out. Uh, let's move on to the DNA communication uh, very quickly. Uh, so that's the uh, typical procedure uh, for, for DNA-based communication. You have encoding, emission, uh, diffusion, reception, and then decoding. Um, encoding is same as uh, before you turn uh, one zero into uh, ATCGs. Uh, as far as the channel, diffusion channel is concerned, uh, typically, we use this uh, uh, Green's function, uh, giving the probability that a molecule reaches point uh, D 
after a time t. Of course, this can also be slightly changed to represent the concentration. Uh, they are basically moving in this uh, free space uh, air. But as far as DNA is concerned, uh, uh, people have given this particular formula uh, for this D, which is the diffusion coefficient. Uh, it's related to the number of uh, BPs of DNA uh, strand. Uh, if you want to do some work, you can start from, uh, from here. Uh, so that's the channel diffusion channel. Uh, if you want to do something at the reception uh, or emission side, uh, one way of doing this is to introduce um, a time slot uh, because we want it's very difficult to detect uh, because you, you can imagine uh, a lot of interference and noise here. And uh, 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 one way to improve this is to introduce a time slot doing some kind of uh, synchronization. Uh, this is uh, something uh, we did uh, for, uh, we did some uh, channel capacity uh, for more information you can refer to uh, this paper. Uh, another diffusion uh, channel is uh, blood vessels. Uh, we did some work uh, here, uh, basically again, to turn them into uh, our wireless uh, familiar uh, channels uh, because their size uh, are different, uh, therefore the blood flow drifts uh, would be different as well. Therefore, they are modeled uh, differently. Uh, adding together, we can have this um, uh, kind of uh, diffusion uh, vascular vessel uh, channel here, and then using the traditional communication theory, information theory techniques, uh, we can calculate its uh, channel capacity. And uh, uh, these two diagrams shows its uh, particular use for drug delivery. It shows the uh, drug concentration. Uh, if you do not uh, you know, do any control, you just uh, release the drug constantly, or you do, uh, in, because if you release too much drug, it's not good to your health, therefore we want to control them. And then how to control them? Uh, in, in, in some time interval, it shows the uh, drug concentration. Uh, so this is mainly done by uh, U.S. Sun, uh, together with probably with uh, uh, Yifan Chen, Professor Yifan Chen, uh, as well. Uh, you know, purely free movement uh, is uh, is not going to achieve good performance. Uh, therefore, people are using this um, uh, molecular motor on a specific rail uh, to achieve uh, directional communication. So this is much better. Uh, we did some work on this one giving a specific um, uh, mechanism here. And this is uh, backed by this uh, uh, nature paper done by uh, Oxford uh, group. Basically, we have this protein as a trail and different molecules. Uh, and then we have this hopper uh, dragging these, uh, you know, those um, uh, bases uh, across. And then we did some uh, channel capacity analysis uh, based on this work. And then we expanded into a multiple uh, uh, tracks. Uh, and then because it's a multiple, there might be some correlations. And then we introduce this uh, uh, interleave uh, technique uh, for coding, uh, aiming to reduce uh, the error rate. Uh, so that's the result. Uh, as you can see, uh, with our interleaved coding, it performs uh, much better. And uh, uh, we are in the process of uh, uh, doing this uh, uh, channel uh, generation uh, using a particular art network called the artificial intelligence, sorry, uh, machine learning network, uh, GAN, uh, GAN, GAN network. Um, because, so this one is uh, uh, data driven. How do we get those uh, data? Uh, we can get it from simulator. Uh, that's one purpose of using uh, simulator because in ethics or in U UESCC, we do not have a chemical department. Uh, therefore, uh, we have to rely on simulators, not like previous speakers. Uh, you can collaborate with the uh, uh, staff from chemical department. I hope my colleague, uh, Michael, who is going to do the next presentation, um, is going to do some uh, experiments. Uh, because doing the experiments uh, in vitro or in vivo is still very expensive and time consuming. Therefore, we need some uh, simulators uh, to help us identify DNA sequence, uh, generating different errors, et cetera, et cetera. 
uh, there are many simulators out there. Uh, uh, the one we are using is called uh, uh, DESP. Uh, it's a very good one because uh, it set up this pipeline and uh, it can uh, simulate errors at each step of this uh, uh, whole process and you can download it. Uh, my students uh, are currently using this one. Uh, basically for each uh, step, uh, you can uh, generate, uh, you know, you can apply different models uh, to generate different errors. It's pretty cool. Uh, in terms of the test bed, uh, there are plenty out there. Um, and uh, the particular one I listed here is from uh, Professor Lin Lin of Tongji University. Uh, the reason I listed here is because it uses um, uh, a DNA, uh, basically apply some negative potential uh, to release, to control the amount of uh, DNA released into the, uh, into the liquid. Uh, so it's a, it's a very good work. Uh, it's related to DNA, uh, most importantly. Uh, of course, there are a lot of other uh, in-field or in-lab um, test beds there uh, and the products as well because of the COVID. We do a lot of PCR tests. Uh, there's uh, a lot of equipment out there. Um, and uh, finally, uh, I'm going to... Um, look into some future directions. Uh, first of all, directional communication, uh, mainly at the wireless uh, aspect uh, and also joint design of communication and, uh, and uh, storage. Uh, so this is very important uh, in order to make our molecular communication or storage uh, commercialize. Automation is very important. And uh, probably in the future, we can combine uh, the computing communication uh, and the storage together into this exciting uh, cross-function ICT, uh, molecular ICT system or probably a computer. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, conclude, uh, DNA-based molecular storage and communication have the great potential to revolutionize our future ICT system, and we look forward to it. <laughs>